Um, Sophie, I don't know uh, where you got that intellectual justice. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, with, I'm an indigenous fellow of intellectual justice, but I'm here on the capacity of Sandit Network, just to let you know. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the sun approach to conservation. And you're free to yeah, ask me uh, wherever you will be uh, interested on. The first thing that I'm interested in, I uh, used to um, show you this map. Uh, it is, uh, I haven't really found the updated one yet, but this map shows actually different sand groups where they are uh, at the moment, where they are located. Uh, we have in here the Khoi Khoin, the Haitian people, but most of the, the sand groups that we know uh, that exist so far are in Botswana. We have a few Khoi people and the Khoi in South Africa, but a lot in Naro, uh, in, uh, in Botswana we have the Naro, where I'm coming from, the Dui, Ghana, and, and so forth. So this map actually also tells you that there are some people, uh, the sun people in Zimbabwe, the, the Chuakwe, uh, and also in Angola, who actually have also migrated uh, into Namibia and some parts of uh, northern Botswana. Uh, one thing uh, for the Sun people that you should know is that um, conservation actually is a result of good leadership. You cannot conserve uh, your environment if you have no steady and good leadership. And if you separate this concept of uh, conservation and good leadership, it actually will result into the misuse of the natural resources that you have. For the Sun people, for you to conserve, you must lead a certain conservation uh, strategy in order for you to uh, enjoy the natural resources in a way that is uh, continued uh, and not uh, depleting. And um, it, is, it is definitely the idea of conservation it is not a new concept for the sand people. It is something that has been existing for quite a millennia and we know it and it's, it's part of our life. Well, how, we, how we live with nature and how we interact with the environment is part of our life. Uh, we, we live with our environment, uh, that, that's, that's uh, the main part of it also. Uh, within our environment, we think that the environment is a living thing. Uh, so we treat it in a way that is uh, actually respectful and we treat it in a most uh, conserving manner. And we also depend uh, from the environment. Everything that we do uh, is from the environment. All life comes from the environment and we respect that and we treat it in a much more, uh, uh, you know, better way than uh, some of the development uh, ideas that have been coming from institutions and governments. For the same people, they not only have ties with their territories of origin, but lived according to the system of belief that land and environment uh, is a symbolic spiritual uh, value. Because each time when we talk about uh, environment and our territory, we attach it with our way of life and how it is actually a symbol of hope if we try to conserve it in a manner that we see uh, in our culture or find in our culture. So we are healing people, uh, the sun people. We heal the environment and we have a certain model of conserving and also preservation. Uh, when it comes to hunting and gathering, uh, of, of about 70% of our food comes from the plants. And sometimes hunting uh, takes on, uh, on different seasons. Uh, like in summer, we don't hunt because we know that the the female animals are bringing up their calves. So you hunt certain uh, small animals or a bull that has uh, been injured. So we know what to hunt, when to hunt, and what to do. And so this animal is the eland. It represents 
at the time of abundance kind of really it is our, our spiritual animal and we feel that when we see it and we find that now uh, it's, it's a symbol that there will be more fat in the environment because this animal never goes skinny through the year it's fat and we also attribute it to our women you know according to my uncle when uh, when a, uh, a girl child uh, has her first menstruation, menstruation this there is a the Elan song that has been danced uh, that the females uh, dance around and also celebrate the womanhood of the girl child and my uncle says that when you see uh, uh, the girl uh, hair thighs are now becoming shiny uh, that's uh, <laughs> that's uh, you know time of abundance and fat uh, and also the richness of our environment and since we come from a healing society we want to heal the environment in different ways uh, and it is also important uh, to us that everything we do uh, if we hunt and gather we think um, and want to do things in a way that is um, uh, that is going towards the healing uh, concept and also healing uh, for us uh, brings uh, balance uh, sometimes when we see people sick in our village, we dance and we heal. The fire brings uh, some kind of um, spiritual, uh, you know, it elevates your, your spirit as a healer and as a dancer to be able to heal people. So we see that there is a balance uh, when it comes to healing and knowing that there is also a spiritual reality uh, that we need to also work and conserve the environment. By conserving the environment, we must be able to see it in a healing perspective. If we conserve it and we, we, heal, we heal it, uh, we also see that it is, uh, we are trying to conserve or maintain our very source of existence. Each one of us, we are responsible for taking care of our environment. Uh, for the sand people, uh, people, when other people exploit the, or damage uh, the earth, uh, we have to stand up uh, and um, take responsibilities and voice out our own expectations of how we want to protect the earth. So for us, this symbol of hands uh, represents a responsibility that we must, you know, uh, stick our hands up and take matters into our own hands and say that we uh, are protectors of the environment, the earth, and that we must be responsible uh, for taking care of it. I'll be uh, really, really uh, sensitive and uh, quite fast. Uh, for us, uh, we believe that if we all take care of the response, uh, of take, take, take care of the environment, we are actually responsible of taking care of uh, and conserving um, uh, the environment. And we must see ourselves as custodians of the earth. Because if we don't, who will actually help us uh, conserve the environment? So we believe that the environment and people are interconnected. We are dependent on the environment and also connected in a way that, is, that cannot be defined uh, because it is, has got a higher uh, uh, way of uh, the communication between us and the environment is really, really intrinsic. This is uh, the tortoise. One of the values, uh, the sun values that we have, is that we see the tortoise and it represents our earth. We must take custodianship of the earth. And the tortoise represents, all the shells actually represent territories land and everything that we see on earth. If you had the, the tortoise, remove one of the shell, it actually uh, is as the same as your barry, uh, deforestation and everything. And that kills the tortoise. It's as much as when you uh, harm the environment by mining the environment, do everything, fracking, you're actually hurting uh, the environment. So this represents uh, the earth, uh, according to 
uh, to the sand people. But in Botswana, we have a very uh, different land tenure system. Uh, it is complicated. It has. Um, it says that um, all the land belongs to the government. And all the policies uh, that we have actually have been already prescribed. The land tenor system, the land tenor policy, uh, the land raising policy of the Botswana has been done since 1960 something seven, I think, before actually when uh, during the time of independence, and it has never been uh, amended yet. So we do not have actually uh, so much. Uh, uh, how to say it, um, we don't have any claim to the land, uh, even if we have been existing there for, you know, time immemorial, but we have no any legitimacy unless we talk about our ancestral, um, you know, if our ancestors lived there and we have to prove it in a way that needs a lot of research and money. But. For, for the land tenure system in Botswana, because it belongs to the government, the land belongs to the government, everything inside the ground and outside the ground belongs to the government, all the natural resources in Botswana. So, three minutes. So, and we know that some of the, most of the African uh, uh, countries are opposed to the term indigenous peoples, which actually gives them the indigenous people, which gives them the kind of uh, the possibility to claim certain rights. Botswana is at the forefront of opposing that concept. And for you to talk about indigenous peoples, it's something that is far fetched. You have to work your way up in order to influence people who can take you seriously. And so, in that regard, people, the government has been talking about development that is not actually in touch with the hearts of the San people and have um, evicted the San people uh, forcefully and they have lost a lot of, some have lost lives and some have lost a lot of things um, that were dear to them. And development for Botswana uh, is only focusing on uh, having uh, big resorts and uh, mining and fracking and uh, you know, some of the mining companies coming from Canada. Uh, <coughs> I don't know what's going on there, but We've been having mining companies coming and flooding from Canada here, not here, but in Botswana, and we have cases of fracking within some of the cons conserved areas. And uh, we need also, we thought that when we have access to this uh, <coughs> knowledge uh, for the Sun people, we can actually able to debate these uh, issues in a way that is uh, better and can also. Uh, be meaningful and understand the government can understand us. Well, thank you. Do we have some questions for Joe? Or? To the chief to negotiate for your mining rights, and that is why you find that even in Zambia. In in Malawi, everything is invested in uh, that gentleman there because then they can bribe him, they can do anything and do exactly what they're doing. Yeah. It's happening in Zambia now. We have chiefs, but as long as they sign the agreement with the state house, they come and they beat you. So it's, it's a problem, right? It's a historical problem. Yeah. Right across the, where they come to. In fact, uh, it's even worse now at home because we had state land and traditional land. Now state land is finished. Most of the resources are in traditional land. Yeah. They are now the World Bank and all these other fellows. They are now forcing the government to start issuing titles so that it's easy for them to. Yeah. So the you know the, the neoliberal era, you know, they've commodified our land and so it's a big problem. And maybe one of the things that uh, might help Skara is to do studies that looks at this in its broader historical context and empower the people. That's the only way maybe we can start to fight this day. Mm -hmm. But if we approach it from San, uh, Lala, Pemba, mm -hmm. you know, little bits and pieces, we won't win. So when you say, for instance, uh, 
uh, in my country, we started all with it, one Zambia, one nation. And by the way, we have some people in Western province who left out in the Zambia. It, it is not in their interest to say, no, these are sad, this is what, this, you know, because they, they want to control. So they, they are just one country invested in one place, and it's easier to deal with that. So the problem is much more complex than that. But what you have said manifest what's happening right across the, the southern region. Mining of minerals has been the main cause. It has been like uh, in the Middle East, this oil. For Southern Africa, it's mining, minerals, gold, copper, diamonds. diamonds. Yeah. I just wanted to also broaden my ideas. Just to well, you just comment. You know, I think that the implication of what you're saying is we need some research targeting that whole complex of capital and state uh, permissions, and uh, you know, and, and we've. Some steps toward that within our network. Um, uh, about two thirds of the mining operations in Latin America are so called Canadian companies because these companies have certain advantages incorporating in Canada. The actual capital is not, it's not two thirds Canadian capital by any means. So you've got already a complicated relationship. Uh, between uh, certain advantageous state laws, where capital finds it useful to incorporate, which uh, jurisdictions are likely to provide some shielding, shielding for the kinds of things they're doing. Um, and so we, we're, we're aware of these, and through these complexities through some of the work we've been doing in Latin America. There, a colleague at McGill who's worked on this, um, Davikin Studnicki Gisbert, is a historian of natural resource extractive activities. Um, and he has something called Mikla, uh, where he has employed, uh, uh, harnessed the enthusiasms of mostly undergraduate students to do inventories of mining operations uh, throughout Latin America, with a particular emphasis on Canadian operations. So just ba getting basic inf information together for, for each other. This is not in the depth that you're suggesting, but it's a start. Mm -hmm. The other uh, is a, a global project um, directed by um, a postdoctoral fellow um, uh, who did her research at the University of Barcelona uh, as a, uh, an ecological economist, uh, Leah Temper. Uh, and uh, it's I, I, it, it's Agnol, Agnol E capital E capital J. It's something like Action Network for in, Environmental Justice Environmental Atlas. Justice Atlas. So there is also a global um, uh, inventory, and it's a it's it's a begins to allow us to see some of the patterns. Um, but um, uh, certainly, we need to recruit more more work on understanding that, that complex and that dynamic. Um. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there time for one more question? Yes. Um, yeah. Justin? Yes. 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 I was really intrigued about your presentation and also um, this, this whole concept of healing and care and um, needing to prove the worth of your environment to you know, mining companies and so forth. Um, but I also found that your presentation was also a sort of using a certain type of narrative you know, that my Ica might use, for example, um, custodians of nature. Is this also a way of, I'm just wondering, um, uh, is it also a narrative of proof in order for you to get in Botswana to get some rights to, to your land? Um, we developed a, a series of values that actually explain who we are and um, how we interact with nature and how we see it as and how we connect with it. Um, in Botswana, it has been um, complicating because there's no one who's interested in the issues of indigenous peoples. 
So to approach that into and also put it in a way that government or institutes understand what we want is a problem. Even if we have research done, uh, it's there's no one who is interested in these issues. So we cannot. It's hard to push our agenda and and to develop something. I don't know if that answers. Thank you. Was the outcome of the Central Kalahari case a victory or a loss for the Sun? Uh, for the Ghana and the Dui, uh, different sort of Sun groups. Uh, both <laughs> uh, victory and loss. Because uh, we have victory. Every time the government comes up with um, a policy that actually will have to inhibit the Sun people there to access resources, uh, they they are taken to court, and then the sign people win. They come up with another policy that actually has to do some more harm to them. So it's I don't know if it's a victory or loss. So yeah. Right. This doesn't just be answered now. I think one of the things we need to think through is whether, given the complexities of dealing with national government and what you describe about and so on, it's true about many countries, even in Sudan, you know, further up in Eastern Africa. Given those complexities, is there any opportunity at all in within regional framework, regional and global framework, which is where where these can, these countries belong and signing up to certain you know uh, yes. uh, yeah. is there any opportunity for you know working through those frameworks while also working at the national level? Because I I, I think it's, it's dangerous to to have your last statement, which is like looking so obvious, and yet yeah, not to yeah, this yeah. reality. Yeah. There is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, it's the Okavango Delta, where the, the northern sand people are using, they're having their livelihood, using fish, you know, that's pretty much their livelihood, and also weaving and all that kind of stuff. So when the government came in and um, prescribed that area as the World Heritage Site, um, they did include the indigenous peoples. But UNESCO wanted, one of the requirements was that to have this as a World Heritage Site, the indigenous peoples have to have consent, they must agree that this is what they want. And so the government went back and uh, did all the study and included the, the Sian people there from the north. Which is actually going to be an opportunity for us to advocate uh, along the lines that actually the government now realizes that there are indigenous peoples because they actually have agreed to the UNESCO requirements. So that actually paves the way for us. It's strategic. Yes, all right. Thanks. Thank you. I, if I could permit myself just to, because I, I, I think Caroline's question and your response to are so interesting. Uh, um, it, it relates to this notion of environmentality and a certain analysis that this burgeoning discourse around uh, indigenous conservators um, is all about positioning for legitimacy, for control of territory, of resources, and so on and so forth. And um, you know, in a gathering like this, and, and especially set within the context of the ICCA consortium, you know, we have this marvelous consensus about indigenous local community responsible, responsible stewardship of environment and resources. I was involved just a few years ago in a case of uh, a sea rights case in Northern Australia as a, an anthropological witness, and there were two other anthropological witnesses. And I can tell you that Australian academia is an extremely cynical ground, especially perhaps the discipline of anthropology. And I was told by Torres Strait Islanders, we look after our sea resources. And they described the rituals and the mythology and the practices, you know, and I put that all in my report. The other two anthropologists weren't interested in those issues. And, in, and, when, and, and they were much in a kind of a deconstructionist notion that, and you know, when, when you talked about conservation practices in the community, they would roll their eyes 
And it was like, oh, here it comes again, the noble ecological <laughs> savage. And, you know, that, and, and, and they, they absolutely refused to engage with, with, although they were very sympathetic to the issue of sea rights, the thing is that in Australia, under this Australian law, if you want to claim a right of governance on a territory, you have to show that it was part of your traditional law and custom. And the judge refused, although he found a native title in general, he refused to acknowledge governance, environmental governance, as part of the bundle of rights, basically because there wasn't consensus among the anthropologists, or the witnesses were not led in sufficient uh, in a sufficiently compelling way to satisfy the judge that that right was there. So these are, these are things that are really con consequential. Um, but I, I, I and it's but it's one of the areas where you know your answer um, demonstrated an absolute confidence in the antiquity of stewardship practices but also an awareness that they need to be translated. <coughs> um, and, and unfortunately, what, what a lot of the, of the cynical anthropology is, that they only hear the translation, and they understand the translation to be basically a, the state's concept of conservation, leading the people into a particular representation of themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is, this is Troubling, you know, and I think as Caroline pointed out, the, the, the sort of discourse that the ICCA consortium promotes um, is, is just the kind of thing that my cynical colleagues, my two colleagues uh, in that case, would say, this is a marvelous fabrication. It's an opportunistic, uh, and I, th maybe we're getting beyond that because this case was, almost 10 years ago now. Um, but um, I know that some of our colleagues in, in academe have not got beyond it. Um, we need to understand, we, we, I think we need to find ways for, in your language, in your own cultural terms, these things can be, can also escape the expected narrative. Just to explain the amount, um, when you can read Atima Bolero. Yeah, Atima. Yeah, Atima, you know, and um, some of my colleagues, there was a shake. <clears throat> this is on the Zambian borders. So some of my colleagues went over to Namibia. And uh, one of my colleagues came back and he said, you know what? Um, one of the, the ladies, some lady, asked me for some money to buy uh, some food from Piccolo, you know, in South Africa. Um, this is a Super <laughs> supermarket. And the guy was saying, you see, they are improving. Yeah. Because she wants to beg. Because I said, <laughs> she, she's begging, <laughs> and she goes to buy food from this, this supermarket. And for you, it's an improvement. <laughs> These are people who never beg. <laughs> you know, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, and he was, uh, he was one of our senior guys. For him, it's his progress. He needs someone begging to go and buy food in the uh, supermarket. Yeah. It's a question. Thank you, Joe. I think we have time for one more. Um, next up is my colleague from McGill, Caroline Sue. Um, actually, it's Oh, we're switching. Yes, we're switching around. Okay.